Welcome to Go Only on Shaw TV. I'm your host, Vanessa Ibera. Well, with summer officially coming to an end, unfortunately, on today's show, we're looking back at the best festivals and events that happened along the Sea to Sky Corridor. And there was no shortage of fun for 2015. From cheese rolling festivals, bike competition, wind festival, it was a great year once again here along the Sea to Sky Corridor. So on today's show, we'll start off with the wind festival. With Squamish known for its wind, tourists and locals converged downtown to take in regatta races and some local towns. Talent. Performers at this year's event include the Will Ross Band, Love Coast, Groove and Tonic, Good for Grapes, and a whole lot more. However, the entertainment wasn't just on the stage. Young Ones also kept the fun going with sidewalk chalk and face painting, and of course, there was the food. Dougie Dog Hot Dogs, who was featured on Dragon's Den a few years ago, was one of many food carts keeping partiers fueled. I naturally, of course, had to try one of the hot dogs just to see what they're like for myself. Now, as we said, one of the main attractions of the Wind Festival, of course, is the regatta races. Over 20 sailboats competed at this year's SOAR competition. And while it's relaxing to watch the event from the side of the shore, we took to the sails recently this summer to find out how tough this sport really is. Using precise focus and care, Scott Shaw McLaren begins to prep his speed cruiser for an evening sail down House Sound. Sailing is a very tactical sport. Not only is the performance of your boat critical, you've also got elements such as wind shifts, uh, differing currents on different sides of the courses. It has a lot of satisfaction there when you really do well. Having taken part in numerous regatta races, including a 13-day sail to Hawaii, Scott, along with the rest of his Squamish Yacht Club race team, is now gearing up for the Squamish Open Annual Regatta, otherwise known as SOAR, taking place the end of July in what's sure to be a spectacle. Coming to Nexon Beach and watching the start where you have 30 sailboats all clamoring for position uh, can be definitely exciting. Lots of yelling. Yelling? This is a sport I need to try out for myself. And what better time than tonight? Hey Scott, I see you're gearing up there. Hey Vanessa, yeah, let's go for a sail. Come on board. Sounds good. Let's do this. As someone who has never sailed before, stepping foot into a world with a vocabulary all its own was, shall we say, intimidating. I'm just setting up the spinnaker lines, so you want to give me a hand? I don't even know what spinnaker is, but I have a feeling I'll learn. <laughs> All right. Spinnaker is a giant flag racers hoist up when going downwind. After rigging its support lines and attempting a few other setups, the rest of the natural high team arrives for their practice. Hey team, you guys are late, let's get going. <laughs> Having placed first in their division and third overall in the 2012 SOAR competition, it's safe to say each of these racers has a roll down pad. Where the real challenge lies is keeping up with mother nature. We're thinking about what the wind's doing all the time and, and looking for how to get the most out of the boat. There's lots of adrenaline when you're racing. It's fun. With the wind fairly calm tonight, the team puts up the smallest of its three flags, constantly adjusting, otherwise known as taxing, the direction of the sail to maintain a steady balance. With Sean, aka Skipper, steering the direction at the helm of the boat, unlike most motor sports, when it comes to sailing, it's the less steering, the better. If you think about this as a brake pedal, anytime you have to turn this, it slows the boat down because it's dragging the rudder back and forth. While it may not be the most important job, I still had to try it. What you're trying to do when you're steering is balance the wind on equal amounts on either side of the sail. So you have little telltales up there. You can see the little yarns that are flipping. Oh yeah. So yeah. you want both those running straight back. It's funny with all this technology, you're literally going off of two pieces of string. Yeah. <laughs> That's your lifeline. With race sailboats weighing up to seven tons, along with changing sheets and lines, a large portion of competing is spent sitting down to counterbalance the boat's weight, providing the perfect time to also breathe and take in the view. As soon as you shut the engine off, everything just kind of slows right down and you just hear the sound of the breeze through the rigging and the wildlife coming all around the boat. You get to places you just wouldn't get to otherwise. A great workout mixed with relaxation? I think I may have just found my new sport. Awesome, I'm sailing. To view all the photos and videos from this year's Wind Festival, be sure to visit the group on Instagram. You can find them at Squamish Wind. You can also visit them online at their website, squamishwindfestival.com. Well, just like it is relaxing to watch sailboats compete from the shore, the same can be said when it comes to taking part in yoga. And recently here, right here in Whistler, thousands of yogis converged to take part in the fourth annual Wonderlust Festival. 
Over the five-day retreat, yoga lovers from BC and beyond took part in yoga practices in the village, as well retreat to music concerts, guest speaker series, and power pack food as part of the annual event. Now, it turns out it isn't just in Whistler here where the Wonderlust Festival takes place. It now happens all across North America. So if you'd like to learn more information, perhaps sign up early for next year's event, you can visit them online at wonderlust.com. Well, switching gears now from yoga to baseball. While it may not be the first thing you think of here in Whistler, slow pitch has gained quite the attraction here in town. And as we find out this next story, it isn't hard to see why. They play hard, they play fast, but most of all, they have a good time. Everybody knows each other. It's always just a fun vibe, competition. It can get pretty competitive, but that kind of adds to the fun of the game. With another season of the Whistler Slow Pitch League almost over, tonight players from its 54 teams are coming together for a special all-star game here at Spruce Grove Park, kicking the event off with a home run competition. We had 25 people sign up and uh, they each get five swings and whoever hits the most wins. Just like snowboarding and mountain biking, baseball too continues to be a popular sport for outdoor enthusiasts in Whistler, with the Whistler Slow Pitch Association officially forming its own organization in 2009. Every week, each of its six leagues teams meet up to compete here at the Diamond. From Japan, Germany and Australia to... New York! Thunder Bay, Ontario! California! For these teams of both visiting and permanent residents, it's about doing what Whistlerites do best, compete. They moved to Whistler to get better at mountain biking. They came to ski fast. There's all this competitive spirit. So even though it's recreational and everyone's having so much fun, there's that sense of pride in what people are playing and the spirit here is amazing. Along with hosting weekly games and an end of the season playoff series, the association also runs a women's clinic at the beginning of the year for newbies to sharpen their skills. For Pamela, who's been playing in the league for 11 years, slow pitches turned out to be a great way to maintain long-term friendships in a town where people come and go so quickly. Every summer we'll see the same people and we'll have a little hiatus throughout the winter, but then again we'll get back together in the summer. So it's fun to keep that circle close. When I first started here, I didn't know nobody, but I've made great friendships over the past 12 years. With plans to add even more teams next year, for this crew, Whistler just wouldn't be Whistler without ball. And the beverages don't hurt either. This year's season wraps up mid-September, but if you'd like to sign up for those women's coaching clinics we mentioned or learn more about the league, visit whistlerslowpitch.com. Well, don't go anywhere, because when we return... Cheese, cheese, and more cheese. It truly is a festival to celebrate the love of Canadian cheese. We get a taste of Whistler's Canadian Cheese Rolling Festival. Welcome back to Go here on Shaw TV. Well, as you can see, the village is a little bit quieter right now, and that's because, unfortunately, summer is wrapping up. But don't worry, we're keeping the energy going on today's show. We're celebrating all the best festivals and events that happened the past few months along the Sea of Sky Corridor, including one of the biggest, Whistler's Crankworks, that took part here August 7th to 16th, where hundreds of bike racers from around the world ballot out in downhill racing, slope style, and enduro. Along with Squamish's Brandon Semenuk winning his fourth race Red Bull Joyride, Claire Bouchard took top spot in the Garbanzo Downhill, Casey Brown also won the Canadian Open Downhill, and Vancouver Island's Steve Smith took home first in the Fox Air Downhill. Along with bike riding competitions, this year's Crankworks also featured a GoPro Dirt Diaries film competition and a photo challenge. So it's definitely another monumental year and looking forward to 2016 already. All right, well, keeping with the theme of sports here in Whistler, the 8th Annual Canadian Cheese Rolling Festival recently wheeled its way into town. And while I can't think of anything better than watching people ballot out, chase cheese down a hill, turns out there is more to the event. It's also aimed at getting people to sample and learn about various cheeses from around Canada, something I recently recently took part in as well.
we can all agree there's nothing better than cheese, and that's what we're talking about today in celebration of the recent 8th Annual Canadian Cheese Rolling Festival that happened in Whistler. And joining me is Sandra De Silva with the Dairy Farmers of Canada. Tough gig you have working with cheese. I love cheese. <laughs> Every girl loves cheese Absolutely. for sure. Absolutely. So before we talk about some samplings we have here, um, Sandra, what's this festival all about? Well, the Canadian Cheese Rolling Festival, it's hosted by Dairy Farms of Canada. As you mentioned, it's the 8th annual. It's up at Whistler and it usually takes place around the August 15th, 16th, 17th timeline. And it truly is a festival to celebrate the love of Canadian cheese. And there's a lot of things that happen throughout the festival. So we have cheese rolling races, we have children's events, we have a cheese seminars, oh cheese gosh. market, we also have recipe demos. It really is a fun event. Everything. Mm -hmm. And as we mentioned, this started in Europe, the Cheese Rolling Festival. It's quite the spectacle to watch if you're not taking place. Uh, take us through how it works exactly. Well, and you're absolutely correct. Um, we took the idea from the Cooper's Hill event in the UK. They've, um, they've been doing it for over 200 years. And it really is, pretty simple and it's pretty self-explanatory. What we do is we take a wheel of cheese at the top of a hill, you roll it down the hill and people just go chasing after it. So it's a, it really is a crazy chaotic event. Uh, who are the top winners this year? This year, uh, the female champion was uh, Rebecca Sherrard. She is from the Washington state. And this year, the male winner was Paul Nguyen, who is from Whistler, which is great. Awesome. But we've had winners from all over the world. We've had racers and winners from the Czech Republic, and we've had them from Australia and oh the States. So, and even this year, we had some from Germany and Spain. So it's, it's great. It's a, it's a really great event. And, People have heard about it all over the world and they've been coming to it, so it's great. It's catching on, like you said, the main really idea is. is to bring attention to cheese, which is what we're doing today. Absolutely. So these three cheeses were featured at the recent festival. Correct. We can get our own little uh, tasting here, a little are. private one. Let's talk with the first one, Colmax Brie. Correct. This is made by Natural Pastures. And Natural Pastures has actually been a, a great partner of ours for the last eight years. They are the one that actually supplies us with the cheese wheel that goes down the hill. Wow. Yeah, so this year the, the wheel that went down the hill was the board cast and it was 11 pounds, which was quite great. Um, but this one here is a Comox Brie. It's, uh, it's wonderful. It's made with uh, milk from select farms within the, the area and uh, it's just a really nutty flavor to it. Just so creamy, the texture just melts in your mouth when you put it in your mouth. So I'm hoping you will try that <laughs> for sure. All right, let's see here. Now just try the whole thing? Yes, please okay. do. The whole thing. Oh yeah. Oh, oh not the same. You don't have to <laughs> do it all the same time. All right, time, I'll take half here. <laughs> we'll see. Mm -hmm. Very creamy. Like I said, yes. instantly melts in your mouth. mouth. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and that's a nice introduction for cheese lovers or who are just getting into cheese tasting. It's not overwhelming. Absolutely. It's mm -hmm. a very nice soft cheese. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those great cheeses that you can serve at parties. You put it into a brie baker, you melt it, and it's just a nice opportunity to scoop everything in it from crackers to that's vegetables. Amazing. It's delicious. It turns into cre cream cheese in your mouth instantly. It, absolutely. Awesome. So moving on to the next one here. Yes, this one here is the Rath Trevor, and it's by a little Qualicum cheese makers. And uh, the wonderful thing about this is that they've taken a, an age-old tradition from the Swiss uh, and created a very Swiss Gruyere type of cheese and they also use the milk directly from their own cows so they do have their own uh, dairy farm um, which really they they're able to just get the flavors that they're looking for from the, the from their cows and the milk that they use. Awesome okay so we'll try this here. Nice. Right. It's a bit of a harder one almost. I feel bad you're not joining me, but you oh. probably eat enough cheese. <laughs> but the really great thing about some of these cheeses as well, as particularly this one, and I and I definitely got this tip from my cheese expert, um, is that even some of the best flavors comes right out of the rind, which is mm. the outside of the cheese. Okay. So a lot of people do tend to cut the rinds off of their cheese when they're enjoying it, but we're always recommending that they keep it and, and, keep and enjoy it, yeah. Now, how long was this one aged before it was actually sold? It, you know what, it, they usually, really it's it's quite a long period of time. I mean, it's not as long as a most aged cheddar would be. Yeah. Um, it, this is definitely not a two week, you know, old cheese. It's definitely at least about two to three months. Wow, that's mm -hmm. got a nice, um, it's quite strong. It's nice, yes. it's got a nice cut to it. And the longer that they age it, the stronger the flavors will become. Yeah. And what are some different ways you see people using cheese? You know, where we were saying you can, buy a, you can get a spread in a restaurant, but what are some other ways? You mentioned that Festival even had demonstrations from chefs there. We did. We had executive chef Ned Bell from uh, U Restaurant in Vancouver, and he actually created six recipes for us this year. 
uh, using cheeses by the cheesemakers that were on site. Um, so we definitely recommend that anyone who's looking to, to take some cheese and, and learn to cook and bake with it, please visit CanadianCheeseRolling.ca. The recipes are actually online and they're absolutely delicious. Let's move on to the last one here. The last I'm one I'm guessing here. this is the strongest. This is quite strong, yes. This is the uh, farmhouse traditional cloth-bound cheddar. Um, this one is actually aged with a cloth that wraps around it, so you get a lot of the flavors and the earthy textures and, and, and tones through the cloth and as you can see through the rind here, like that's just from the aging process and how it's gotten darker there. So I'm encouraging you to try that one. All right, I'm Cheddar's excited. is a personal favorite of mine. Yeah, I love strong cheese, so mm -hmm. looking for this one. Yeah, that is really good. Mm -hmm. that, that's probably twice as strong as this one here. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you can really taste the earthiness mm -hmm. because of the, what, the way they've aged it. And last question, have you seen a real rise last year to people choosing to support their local dairy farmers, not just buying, you know, the big box store cheeses, say, have you seen a real increase in that? We absolutely have. And people have really come out and said that they really want to support uh, local. It's really all about local right now. So um, people are very, very adamant to make sure that they're supporting their local farmers and their local cheesemakers. And like I said, we've got amazing artisanal cheesemakers from across the country. Mm -hmm. So as far as PEI, so yeah. Let's go locally, don't go back for sure. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for Thank joining you me, for Sandra. I can still taste that creamy Comox Brie, one of my favorite cheeses I've tried so far. Tell us, what is your favorite cheese you can't live without? And also, who is your favorite local dairy farmer? You can reach out to us on Twitter at Shaw TV Seat to Sky. Well, don't go anywhere because coming up later in the show. When people are fed, that has an amazing impact throughout their day. Find out how a generous grant is helping feed Squamish's less fortunate. Welcome back to Go here on Shaw TV. Well, while we're all a little sad, let's all admit it that summer is coming to an end. Don't worry, we're still celebrating here on the show the best festivals and events that took place this summer to keep the energy going. And as we all know, while it's fun to watch extreme sports along the Sea of Sky corridor as part of those events, sometimes it's nice to slow it down, which is exactly what they did recently at the 11th annual Slow Food Cycle Sunday that took place in Pemberton, August 16th. Every year, cyclists from throughout the Sea of Sky Corridor cycle 50 kilometers down Pemberton Meadows Road, stopping to try out local food, as well watch local musicians perform at various farms along the way. With hundreds of people coming out for this year's event, it remains one of the most popular in Pemberton. It's getting bigger every year. To view videos and photos of this year's event, swing by their website at slowfoodcycle.com. Well, sticking with the theme now of the community coming together with a low vacancy rate and high housing costs, the Squamish Helping Hand Society remains a welcome safety net for residents looking for a roof above their head and a warm meal. And now thanks to a recent grant, they're branching out their network even more. It starts here. We pick up food from Nestor's, Save on Foods and Starbucks. With his cart piled high, Squamish Helping Hand Society volunteer Jonathan begins his weekly routine of loading his truck with dozens of boxes of donated veggies, dairy and other goods to go towards feeding the city's homeless and low-income residents. A lot of the produce is still good, it's just not necessarily sellable, maybe it's got a blemish to it. It just makes perfect sense to give it to them, not pay to throw it out, saves us time, saves us money and does good things for the community. I think that's it for here, yeah. Here at Squamish Helping Hand Society, the group of workers and volunteers save around 350 pounds of food a day from going into the landfill. After unloading groceries, it is then weighed and distributed to go towards its hamper programs and cooking up two hot meals a day to its roughly 100 clients. After receiving grant funding from the BC Lottery Corporation in 2014, the nonprofit society has also added a food to go program to its services, making around 75 bag lunches to be delivered to local schools, along with offering free sandwiches to adults at its downtown location. We started to really envision how we could, you know, access um, food that was being wasted and going to the landfill, how we could save that and put it into our food system here. With the help of a gaming grant, it took on a whole initiative. 
With reports showing Canadians on average waste 40% of their food, for Jonathan and the Society's other 50 workers and volunteers, the shocking statistic is also motivation to ignite immediate change. On the bigger scale, we complain a lot about the world at large, but uh, there's a huge need in the place that we live. It's very easy to make a larger impact on a smaller scale. I enjoy my Monday routine and visiting everybody. A lot of smiling faces. With plans to merge the Squamish Food Bank and Helping Hand Society into one location down the road, for these selfless hands, it's about ensuring all members of the community have a quality of life. And that starts with a full stomach. When people are fed, that has an amazing impact throughout their day. For kids, it means they're able to learn better. For you know people who are homeless, it means that their strength is up. Food access and food security is not supposed to be about shame. There is plenty of food on the planet. Let's feed everybody. Squamish Helping Hand Society is open 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So if you want to learn more about their services, you can visit them online, of course, at SquamishHelpingHands.com. Or better yet, swing by their downtown location in Squamish. They're just north of Main and 3rd. And tell them we say hi. All right, well, moving on to our last event of the day we're celebrating here on GO. Who can forget the Squamish Valley Music Festival? It rolled into our town the beginning of August, and what an event it was. I gotta say, I've never actually been to a festival, and I was definitely impressed. The sixth annual Squamish Valley Music Festival rolled into our city once again the first week of August. Once again, there was no shortage of energy. I love Squamish Music Festival! What brought you to the festival? My friend and son. Sam Smith. Sam Smith brought me here. Alabama Shakes. That is the Kentness show of the festival if you're into rock and roll music. So far, it's been amazing. We had a lot of people come out early yesterday. We had an amazing day of music, and uh, you know, people were very well behaved. And uh, yeah, we had a great night. With the record-breaking 118,000 music lovers attending this year's festival, featuring close to 90 performing acts, the beer gardens and partying was in full force throughout the weekend in what remains Squamish's largest event. However, while getting a chance to party for three days in one of the most beautiful places in BC remains a top attraction for this festival, there are other aspects that keep people coming year after year. Now that we have established the music program so well and, and everybody's come to expect a certain amount from that, we've really turned our attention into, into the details. We've got a giant art pavilion that's new this year that features 21 muralists that are live painting throughout the weekend. Along with art and clothing pop-ups, attendees of all ages were also treated to live performances and pancake breakfasts atop the nearby Sea the Sky gondola, along with musical performances downtown. And then of course, there's the food. What are you ladies eating here? Deep fried red velvet Oreos. <laughs> they are so good! From Cajun pulled pork and dim sum to cheesecake on a stick, the festival's 75 food carts, and most festival caterers for that matter, go beyond granola bars and hot dogs. The food's actually really good, I was surprised. I didn't expect that many options. There really is something for everybody out there, and you see a different demographic at every festival. I love finding that, that musical act that you've never heard of before, and you kind of walk by and you're like, holy cow, they're fantastic. With close to 40 music festivals now taking part every summer throughout BC and plans to add even more art installations and attractions to next year's Squamish Valley Music Festival, there really is something for everyone, no matter what type of festival goer you are. Believe it or not, they've already announced the times and dates for next year's festival. It's happening August 5th to 7th, of course, in Squamish. If you want to learn more about the event, visit SquamishFestival.com. Well, that wraps up our show today, celebrating the best festivals and events along the Sea of Sky Corridor. Again, what a great year it was. But of course, it keeps going. Fall is just around the corner, and we're always looking for story ideas. So if you have any other events you want to let us know about, people we should profile, again, reach out to us on Twitter and Facebook. And as always, you can catch all of our stories in HD on YouTube. Just visit the link on the bottom of your screen. Until next time, I'm Vanessa Vera.